prophets, and we studied uh, Zephaniah, and now we're going to study a new guy. First things first, I asked you to look up this name and try to find the correct pronunciation of H-A-G-G-A-I. I will confess to you that I have grown up my entire life memorizing the Old Testament books of the Bible, and I always call it Haggai. Haggai is what I would say. Well, I decided I want to see what this is really like in Hebrew, and I just went to Strong's Concordance and looked up that pronunciation, and I thought, wow, <laughs> that's nothing like how I've been pronouncing, pronouncing it. Uh, just like when I studied the book, we studied the book of Habakkuk many years ago. A lot of people call it Habakkuk. Well, it's not how it's pronounced. It's pronounced Habakkuk. And just like many people like to throw around the word agape, they call it agape love. Well, it's agape is the correct pronunciation. I know it sounds like it's nitpicking, but I thought it would be interesting for you to, ter to, to determine how that word, how this guy's name is pronounced. Anybody come up with some pronunciations? Yes. Haji. 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 Okay. Anybody else? What's that? Yes. That's that. That's a town in Illinois. <laughs> According to Strong's pronunciation, uh, the the H is like a CH sound, kind of like German. Anybody that's taken German, they have this kind of sound that they use all the time. So it's Kagahi, is how Haggai is pronounced, Kagahi. Yes. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to have a hard time saying that uh, because of the way I've learned to say it my entire life. There's a law called the first law of primacy, and the way you learn something first is the way you resort back to it, especially under pressure when I was a flight instructor. Uh, people would learn how to fly a plane incorrectly from these podunk airports, and they'd come to us, and I'd have to reteach them how to fly the plane correctly, but when they got in trouble, they'd go back to their old way and probably will kill themselves someday. But nevertheless, that's the first law, of, that's the law of primacy. And so I'll resort to that. So I'm not going to do the sound all the time. I just can't do that. But I'm going to try to say Hagai when I pronounce this guy's name in correct pronunciation. And we're going to look at the whole first chapter today. We can do that, and you'll see why. Uh, there was a radio show that began with these lines. There's a thing that you plan to do, and then there's the thing you end up doing. Most of us start off our lives with some plan A, which we abandon, switching to plan B, which becomes our life. And then the program was all about the stories of people's lives who had taken an unexpected twist along the way. Uh, their lives turned out far differently than they had originally planned. Now, a lot of us can identify with that, can we not? I know I certainly can. Uh, you remember when you were in high school? I do. 18 years old, thereabouts in high school. And you decide your, what your future is going to be. What do I want to be? What am I going to do after high school? And what I wanted to do after high school was play football. Uh, people told me how good I was, and I believed them. And I could, we were going through some of the stuff mom had uh, after her recent passing, and there was a scrapbook of my football days, and there's my picture on the newspaper almost every week, you know, and all that stuff. And so I wanted to play football. My best options to play uh, was for a Division I school, the University of Akron, or go off to an Ivy League school called Dartmouth that had uh, uh, tried to recruit me, or I could go where I thought I had the best chance of starting as a freshman, and that was Mount Union College, now known as Mount Union University in Alliance, Ohio. And plus, I could stay closer to home that way. Well, I went to Mount Union where my football career went nowhere because the coaches wanted to play upperclassmen. I was better than the upperclassmen. They were afraid of me, but they got to play the games and I didn't, so, you know, that didn't sit well with me. Uh, when my football career was over, I had to decide, okay, now what are you going to do next? Well, I was going to be a school teacher. I was going to be a highway patrolman. A few other careers crossed my mind. Uh, I eventually decided, I think I'm going to be a, a pilot. 
I'll be a flight instructor. And I was. I was a hotshot pilot. I got my private, my commercial, my instrument, my instructor rating in a little over a year. And there I was set to be a pilot. Uh, if you had told me when I was going to graduate at 18 years old that I was going to be a pastor, I would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> I had no intention, no desire whatsoever. But in the providence of God, plan A, plan B, plan C, and a few others ended, and God's plan for me to pastor came into being. But even then, after about nine years in the ministry, I determined that no one can pastor a sovereign grace church in this culture. It just isn't going to fly. People are not believing this kind of stuff. You know, if you're going to be a successful pastor in this day and age, you have to be uh, some kind of charismatic guy or some kind of guy that, you know, has a, a good sales representation and you're going to give the people what they want, the kind of gospel that they want to hear. And, you know, churches like I wanted to preach, it just can't be done. And so we moved to Florida and I started a Christian counseling center. But after everything is said and done, here I am pastoring a Sovereign Grace Baptist Church for the last 36 years. That was not my plan. That was not my plan. Now, many of our lives have not turned out how we originally planned, sometimes for the better. I think in my case it is. I'm far happier being a pastor of a church than I ever would have been flying as a pilot. Uh, life isn't what we thought it would be, but all in all, circumstances worked out somewhat well. Maybe plan B or plan C turned out much better than our original plan A. In other cases, though, plan B seems like a, a downgrade for people. Once you were full of hope and enthusiasm for the future, but somehow along the way, your vision of the future fell apart. It may have been some significant sin in your life that derailed you. Maybe it was some kind of personal tragedy or, or simply the pressure of adverse circumstances that gradually stole your dream away. Now you feel stuck in the plan B trap. Now, if that's where you find yourself, then God has a message of hope and challenge for you coming through this ancient prophet named Haggai. The year was 520 B.C. Uh, peace had finally returned to the Persian Empire after a lengthy time of political instability. Uh, the rebel leader, Gamada, had stirred up trouble throughout the empire after the death of the former king, Cambyses, and now he had been captured and executed. If the internet of the day existed back then, uh, everybody would have been excited that this guy was dead, and there's a new guy on the block, a new king named Darius, who was now in control. Some people call him Darius, if we're going to get nitpicky about names. Meanwhile, in the empire's tiny Middle Eastern nation of Judah, nothing much was happening. Most of the people who lived there had long since given up hope that their God, Jehovah God, would somehow intervene on their behalf. They once had hope, great expectations that God would do something special with their lives as God's chosen people. Eighteen years earlier, the Persian Emperor Cyrus had issued a decree that allowed the Jewish exiles in Babylon to return back to their home of Judah. And he gave them permission to rebuild the temple, the centerpiece of their religion. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles. They left Babylon behind, all excited to establish a new community of God's people that would be a light to the nations, a, 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 a city on a hill. They would rebuild God's temple, and the Lord would restore his presence among them as he had in the past. That was their plan A. But once they returned to the land of Judah, these former exiles discovered that there was bitter opposition to their rebuilding plans. People that lived around them weren't so happy that they were back. And they were discouraging them in any way they could from rebuilding this temple. If you want to read about that, read Ezra chapter 4. 
Anyway, they, they had many enemies, they were strong, they were politically well connected, and they were determined to put an end to these efforts of rebuilding a temple or even establishing themselves in, Ju in Judah land. By the time of Haggai's first prophecy, nearly 20 years on, the return exiles had now settled into a very uncomfortable status quo. They were grinding out a slim daily existence while coming to terms with the difficulties of this plan B life. Thoughts went through their mind. Why struggle to do great things for the Lord, like rebuilding the temple, when the days in which we live are apparently days of small things, according to Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10. Why not just, as we like to use the term here in Florida, hunker down, keep out of sight, do your best to improve your own personal and family situation. That's the best we can do right now. Maybe tomorrow would be another day, as Scarlett O'Hara proclaimed in Gone with the Wind, if you're familiar with that movie. But today, this is all we got to work with. This is, this is what, this, these are the cards we've been dealt. Was this the way the promises of God to Israel would end? Not with a bang, but just with a weak little whimper? Was God's purpose for the people who had returned to their land, this land that had been promised to their forefathers, that now that they're there, they're just going to live out a kind of plan B kind of existence? Was that what's going on? In the words of Paul in the New Testament, God forbid, God forbid, by no means was that the case. If they thought that, they misread God and his promises to them. So into this situation of quiet despair, God called and sent his prophet with a message of new hope for his people. And it's a message that speaks hope to us as well in 2020. And I think we could use some hope Amen. right now. So the book of Haggai is filled with exact dates, with six precise markers that give us the day and the month as well as the year in this short book. Look at verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying. So here's the markers. There's a time period here. And there's a reason why this particular prophet is so concerned with these dates. They serve not just to locate the activities of Haggai's generation against the background of world events, but also to remind his hearers of this ticking theological clock counting down the 70-year period that Jeremiah had prophesied for the exile. You can read about that in Jeremiah 25, verses 11 and 12. He said exactly when this prophecy is going to take place and when this stuff is going to go down. Starting with the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., 66 years had now passed. At least some among those that returned were counting down the days, watching and waiting for this promised restoration of Jerusalem to its former glory. But not everyone shared their excitement. Many had taken on a different perspective mentioned here in verse 2. This people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Now, we were sent back to do that, and they're saying, well, it's not time. It's not the right time to do that. Nobody disputed the necessity of rebuilding the temple. Everyone agreed that this is a good thing to do. They're just saying something that they thought was apparent to everyone. And that is, it's just not the right time, folks. It's just not the right time. It's kind of easy to guess their reasons. In the short term, the sixth month was harvest time. Everybody's going to be out in the fields. Everybody's going to be gathering whatever crops they had planted so that they could survive. And so we, you know, we just don't have time to deal with this temple building right now. On a larger scale, these were very difficult times economically for everyone. During this time, King Darius was pushing through economic reforms, tax increases, which would add to their financial difficulties. 
oh, we've got to harvest this stuff, we've got to pay more taxes. And with all this going on, there's certainly a lack of funds for a huge project like rebuilding the temple. Just keeping food on the table is hard enough right now. In addition to these specific factors, there seems to have been a general discouragement about the future. They're just coming from living long lives of difficulties, and they thought it was going to be great when they got back from Babylon, but it wasn't. After living on this Plan B track for a while, it was just hard to see any kind of better future or different future than what they had. Now, the Lord's response to this way of thinking was to expose Israel's inconsistency and lack of true biblical wisdom. Look at verses 3 and 4. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Here's the preacher. He's got a word from the Lord. You, you know, you're, you're worried about your own houses, and you're saying you can't build the Lord's house? If, if now was such a really bad time to build God's house, why was it time for the people to dwell in sealed houses? Sealed means paneling, and that's a significant word. You're taking care of your own house, and you're making it pretty nice, and you're not taking care of the Lord's house. The word sealed, it means paneled. And it doesn't mean simply that their houses were ornately decorated. It's an unusual Hebrew word specifically used to describe Solomon's temple four out of the other five times it's used in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 6, 9, 15, chapter 7, verse 3, verse 7, talking about this, the, uh, Solomon's house that he built, which is the Lord's house. So a guy's point is that the people had been quietly happy to put the same kind of resources into building their own houses that they claimed were not there to build God's house. God's house had these fancy paneling. We put them in our own house. We got enough money to do that, but we don't have enough money to do God's house. We, we find it very easy in, in, in our own lives, right? This is kind of a common thing in our own lives, especially during difficult times. We find it easy to draw back from serving God, serving others, claiming we need all of our resources to take care of our own needs. We need to take care of our own selves. We don't have the time, the resources to do God's stuff. And so the difficulty of life becomes an excuse for becoming self-centered. We take the gifts and resources that we do have and hoard for ourselves the very things that might be used in the Lord's service or in the service of others. But such a strategy is counterproductive, as Haggai pointed out. Verse 5, Now therefore, saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. What are you thinking about? What's going on in your mind? You need to think about this. You're paneled, you've got nice paneled houses. God's house, you're saying, we don't have time for it. We don't have the resources. It's too tough to deal with that right now. You need to think about that. For all their busyness in pursuing their own goals, the people of God were not achieving the goals that they were trying to accomplish themselves. Though they had sown abundantly, they had not reaped in equal measure. Instead, verse 6 says, you have so much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but you're not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. You're, you're going about this. Think about this. You're working so hard for yourself, and you're not getting anywhere. You have just about enough to eat, not enough to feast, just a little bit to drink, but not enough to have a party that they had something to wear, but not enough to keep out the cold. It was as if they were taking their wages that they had worked so hard to earn and putting those wages in bags with holes in it. What they're trying to get out of life was not what they were putting into it. They were not experiencing the fullness of God's blessing, but rather an inadequate, unfulfilled life in which every pleasure proved disappointing, incomplete, elusive, or trying so hard to make ourselves happy and make our lives better, and it's just not working out. 
Why was life this way? Certainly the problem wasn't God's lack of power to bless them. The problem was with their own actions, which is why the Lord tells them repeatedly through Haggai to consider your ways. Verse 5 and verse 7. Think about what you're doing and settling for a plan B lifestyle, a life centered on themselves. They were not acting in faithfulness to their obligation as God's people. They had put their own interests before God's interests, and as a result, they were reaping the consequences of their priorities. A life of futility, working so hard to take care of self, spinning your wheels, and you're still not happy. They're running faster and faster like hamsters on a wheel and getting nowhere. Now, doesn't this sound like the lifestyle of a lot of Americans? Doesn't it really? Many of us as Americans experience that same futility of racing through life faster and faster, working harder and harder, but never getting where we want to be, never being satisfied. And the reason is we're pursuing, pursuing our own goals and not God's goals. Many Near Eastern curses were regarding this futility of life as they threatened a hamster in a wheel kind of life experience. And I see Americans as hamsters and wheels and getting nowhere, getting nowhere. I told you this was good, didn't I? How this affects Americans. These curses, these Middle Eastern curses have become a reality in the lives of God's unfaithful people. The solution to their problem was very straightforward. Verses seven and eight. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. They needed to abandon their excuses as to why they couldn't serve the Lord and to reorder their priorities. In the place of wood that they had eagerly gathered to panel their own houses, they should go to the hill country, gather wood for God's house. Instead of running around on behalf of their own houses, they should instead work to turn God's house from some useless, desolate ruin into a place in which God might be glorified. That was his goal for them. Verse 9 says, Ye look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste? And ye run every man unto his own house. See, the temple had been torn down. It was rubble. And it's still rubble. And they're not wanting to rebuild it because they've got to take care of themselves. Until they got their priorities straight and God's house restored, they could hardly expect to see greater fruitfulness in their own lives and in the lives of their land. And so verses 10 and 11 say, Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew. And the earth has stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of thy hands. The hands. You want to do it your way? Here's what you get. So here's preacher Haggai. I said it, didn't I? Haggai. <laughs> I knew I was going to. So there he is preaching away saying, you need to think about this. You're all selfish. You're all self-centered. Take care of God's business. And the result of his preaching was immediate. Zerubbabel, Joshua, and all the remnant of people recognized the voice of the Lord as it came through prophet Haggai. And then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord, verse 12 says. That's a good result of that sermon, that people listened. They were convicted of their sin of unfaithfulness to the Lord regarding the temple, and they recognized God's justice in judging them. This is the effect of hearing God's word it should, always, it should always have an effect on us. When we hear the word of God read, when we hear it preached, it needs to have a proper effect on us. As we listen carefully to the scriptures and consider our ways, we will always find areas in our lives that are not in line with God's plans for our life. 
Which of us can truly say that we have always sought God's kingdom first and have pursued his righteousness with all of our heart, soul, and mind? Anybody want to raise their hand and say, I do that? I'm not going to raise my hand. I did, but I'm not saying I do that. We don't. It's always amusing and sometimes a little sad when you come across people who, who say, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. You ever hear somebody say that? I heard some Mennonite guy say, I haven't sinned in 30 years. Well, yeah, you did. You just lied. <laughs> it, it, and again, it's funny, but it's sad. They're, they're so out of touch with reality. Even keeping the first commandment that requires that we always put the Lord as the top priority in our lives ahead of everything else, that's far beyond any of our abilities. Instead, we're guilty of building our own houses with great passion while neglecting the Lord's house. Now, the immediate effect of conviction of sin on the exiles was to move them to fear. Again, verse 12 says, and the people did fear the Lord. This is exactly the right response. All, after all, the Lord had earlier sent his people into Babylonian captivity because of their persistent unfaithfulness. What would happen to those who had returned to being blatantly unfaithful again? It isn't, a, it isn't a coincidence that the text calls them the remnant of the people in verses 12 as well as 14. This was a small group who had survived God's judgment at the hands of the Babylonian and now fearing the consequences of, the, of, of their own sins, they feared God. Fearing the consequences of our sins is not an irrational reaction for us either. Sometimes it blows my mind when Christian people are just living blatantly sinful lives and it doesn't bother them. It doesn't, they, they, there's no fear of the Lord. I don't know about you, but when I sin, I think, I'm going to get chastened. <laughs> I'm going to get it for this. And I deserve it, and I know that, and God chastens those whom he loves, and so I better repent of this. That's called fear of the Lord. I better stop doing this. I better stop thinking this. I better stop saying this, or God's going to deal with me. He doesn't mess around with sin in his people, and that's what these people came to the conclusion of. On the contrary, God is holy and pure, and we are sinfully self-centered. So it's a very rational response to be afraid. But as the returned exiles turned their hearts toward the Lord, they found that the Lord was also turning toward them. He announced again through his prophet the comforting good news of verse 13. I am with you, saith the Lord. In spite of their sin, when they came to God and repented, there was immediate restoration of the relationship. This is good news for us as well. The, the Lord is not some harsh taskmaster waiting for us just to step out of line so he can zap us. Oh, you did that? I'm giving you a flat tire. Oh, you did that? I'm going to cause your refrigerator to break down. You'll have to buy a new one. He isn't like that. He, he confronts us with our sin so that he can forgive us and show us his mercy and his grace as we repent. He's a loving father who waits with open arms all day long to welcome home the returning prodigal, as we see in Luke 15, 20. After the, after the Lord's people repented and restored to the Lord's favor, they showed how real their commitment to the Lord was very quickly. Verse 14, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Godly sorrow for our sin is good and right, but that's not the end goal. It's always supposed to result in the proper response of renewed obedience. The people's response was almost immediate. In the four and twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king, verse 15 says, they began to work. On the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius, this was just twenty-three days, if you add it up, 
23 days after the first word of the Lord came to the people through the prophet Haggai. At the same time, I think it's worth noting that the people's response was not something they worked up in themselves. It was the working out of something God was doing in them by his spirit. Whenever we obey the Lord, even for a second, it's because God has given us the desire and the strength to do so. Don't forget that. God is sovereign over our sanctification, just as he is over our justification. As our London Confession of Faith says, I don't know where you're at. This is chapter 16, verse 3, page 678 in your Trinity hymnal, if you want to look it up. Here's what it says, talking about us. Their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but wholly from the Spirit of Christ, and that they may enable them, uh, and, and that they may be enabled thereunto. Besides the graces they have already received, there is necessary an actual influence of the same Holy Spirit to work in them to will and to do of His good pleasure. And yet, are they not hereupon to grow negligent? as if they were not bound to perform any duty, unless upon a special motion of the Spirit. But they ought to be diligent in stirring up the grace of God that is in them. All right, at this point, there's a caution needed. It would be very easy for any pastor, including myself, to preach some guilt-inducing sermon from chapter 1 of Haggai. Simply telling people to examine their ways and repent of their sins and get with God's program for their lives and God will bless them for it. Repent of your plan B lifestyle and pull yourselves together and follow God's plan A instead. Now, if the church happens to be in a building program or shortly in the future, using this passage is all the better, right? Simply title the message, God loves a cheerful builder and then browbeat the congregation for living with all their modern comforts. Ah, you chose to go on vacation this year when you could have put money in the building program. You bought a new car, and God's house is not being built. You're just taking care of yourself. Oh, wouldn't that be fun to do as a pastor? Just browbeat them to death. You terrible, worldly people, you. Now, let's let's work together and build God's house. So we can experience the fullness of God's blessing. Once we have our new building, God will bring in a bunch of people and our church will grow and we'll have a greater impact in the community. That's God's plan A for us. It isn't for you to have a new car and go on vacation. Let's take care of God's business. For those inclined to the health and wealth gospel, a guy's prophecy might be even more attractive with its apparent implication that the reason we aren't experiencing personal prosperity, the reason you didn't get that new car, the reason you didn't get that promotion at work, the reason you couldn't buy that new house on the golf course is you aren't giving enough to God's work. You give to God's work and you'll have that stuff, brothers. Amen? (laughs) Right? I mean, you've heard that stuff, have you not? The problem at looking at this passage in this way, is that our focus is not on Christ, but simply getting more material things. Oh, I get it. I get stuff if God gets his stuff first. So, that's how we'll treat these things. We treat seeking God as a means of building our own kingdom. So it's the same thing. Whether in the form of that kingdom is a bigger building for us as a church, or a bigger ministry, or personal prosperity, or fulfilling relationships, whatever it is. We, we kind of buy off God. We replace a failing pragmatism, pragmatism, if you don't know, it just means doing whatever works. We replace a, a failing pragmatism, take care of yourself first, with a more successful pragmatism. Take care of God's stuff first, and then he'll take care of my stuff. And this attitude explains why a lot of people who read the prophet Haggai instinctively ask, well, did it work? Did they build this and then all all this good stuff happen? In other words, did the rebuilding of the Lord's house, in fact, 
lead to better harvest. Half of your lifestyle, women getting pregnant and having babies, because that was big for them back there. Did it boost the land's productivity? Did God open the floodgates of heaven and shower his people with blessings? Because they did this. These are the questions that Haggai had very little interest in. He didn't record the results for us of the rebuilding of God's temple in terms of record harvest and bumper crops and greater fertility among the women. For sure, he tells the people that from now on, they can expect God's blessing. Under the terms of the covenant that he made with them on Mount Sinai, God's blessings would normally come in the form of physical blessings. In that time period, the blessing of a fruitful land was a visible marker of God's blessing on Israel. But those material blessings were not God's primary response to the people's obedience. The blessing of his presence and the blessings of his favor, that's the greatest blessing of all. Now, it's very appropriate for us that looking at this text to recognize that in many ways we are like the people that Haggai prophesied to. We too, at times, have focused on building our own houses and not the Lord's. And so the call for repentance that came thousands of years ago with these people is a call for us to repent as well, just as the first hearers of this prophecy did. The result of this wrong focus in our own lives also has been frustration. This is a huge problem with the materialism that drives our American culture. And it is. We're driven by materialism, folks. We are a materialistic culture. And it's a very unreliable and a very eventually unfulfilling master. You, we don't get there. Materialism does not get us there. We can put our own material needs first. We can live by the motto, he who dies with the most toys wins but still fail to prosper materially. There are many unsuccessful materialists around us. All the kids that go to school, what do the teachers tell them? You need to study. You need to work hard. You need to get good grades. Why? Why do I need to study get good grades? So you can go to college. Why do you need to go to college? So you can study some more and get good grades. <laughs> Why? So I can get a, you can get a good job. And why do you want a good job? So you can have good money. And why do you want to have good money? So you can buy stuff. Do things that will make you happy. And the kids buy into that lie. And they do it. And they go to college. And they finally get their job. And they're getting money. And they're buying their stuff. And they're not happy at all. There are many unsuccessful materialists that surround us. And even when it is successful, materialism is still an unfulfilling master. Even if we do get the most toys, we find that they never, ever really satisfy. The hamster never gets to the top of the wheel. Paneled houses are never enough. And you know people like that. They have the stuff. They have the boat. They have the cars. They have the houses. They have all of this stuff, and they're still miserable people. I often think of the rich people in Hollywood, the actresses and the actresses, actors, actresses, whatever. And, and you read about them, and they're miserable. They're making millions of dollars, and they're miserable. The pleasures of materialism always proves to be temporary. Oh, you might be happy when you get that new house for a while. You might be happy when you get that new car for a while, but eventually... This doesn't make you happy. What satisfaction is there at the end of life and having lived for your own kingdom, even if, what, even if doing that accomplishes many personal goals, even if you've lived out your plan A life, what happens when you have all this stuff that the Lord says is eventually it's going to rust, it's going to rot, it's going to burn, or it's going to be forgotten? You ever drive by a junkyard? Those smashed up, beat up, rusted out hulks of cars 
That was in the showroom one time. And somebody walked in there and said, boy, look at that car. Man, I want that thing. I want it so bad. And now it's in the junkyard, smashed into a little square, in a scrap heap. Rust, rot, burn, or forgotten. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? A guy, he gives us different reason to live, folks. The opposite of building our own house is to repent and humble ourselves before the Lord and pour our energies into building God's house. This is the only way to true blessing. Jesus puts it this way. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seeking God's kingdom and his glory is the one thing in life that brings assured, lasting fulfillment to our souls. Just as it is the people who first heard Haggai's message, we too must repent of our sins, humble ourselves before the Lord, and seek to build God's house. But building God's house means far more than simply writing a large check to the building fund. In Haggai's day, the temple was the visible symbol of the Lord's presence in the midst of his people. That's the importance of the temple. For us, however, the visible symbol of God's presence among us is no longer a temple or even a church building. But according to the New Testament, the symbol of God's presence among us is the body of Christ itself. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, which means God with us. The one who physically makes God present among his people. To him, the glory of God took flesh and dwelt amongst us, as John 1.14 says. He is personally the fil- fulfillment of everything that the, temple, the, the tabernacle and the temple symbolized. That's why when Jesus had cleansed the Jerusalem temple of the money changers and was asked to justify his actions, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. John 2.19. Jesus didn't have in mind rebuilding a temple like Haggai he did, Rather, he meant his own body would be raised up on that third day. His body was itself the temple of God, the physical representation of God in the midst of his people. Now that Jesus has ascended to heaven and poured out his spirit among his people, God is present in the world in us, in his people. As the body of Christ in the world, the church is now the new temple, made up of Jews and Gentiles together. The church is the place where people around us experience the presence of God. In the church, we who are Christians are being built together as a holy dwelling place for God by his spirit, as we read in Ephesians 2, 21 and 22. We ourselves are the new temple that Christ came to build. The visible symbol of God's activity in the world is us. For us, then, building God's house means serving God in the job of making his presence known into the world. If this is what building God's house means, then, clearly it is a job far beyond any of our capabilities. We can't do that. It's not simply a matter of brick and mortar, but a collecting and shaping living stones, as we're called, into a dwelling place for his glory. How could we even begin to do such a job? One answer is to go back to John chapter 2, where Jesus cleansed the temple. When Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple, his disciples recalled the Old Testament verse that says, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, quoting Psalm 69.9. Building God's house is ultimately a job that will be done by his zeal, not ours. At that point in Jesus' ministry, the disciples had little idea what it would mean for Jesus to be consumed for God's house. It was relatively straightforward for him to come in judgment against this rebellious people and make a whip and drive out sinners out of God's house. It would be a far more painful job for Jesus to come as the Savior and make sinners fit to live in God's house forever. Doing that would mean that God the Father would have to turn the whip on his own son so that he could take the sinner's punishment for them. It is in this way that God is building his new temple, the church. 
But this doesn't mean that we get to sit back and relax and say, okay, build the church. I'm cool with that. No, God's work is the foundation and encouragement for our work. God works in us as he did in the lives of Haggai's hearers to motivate us to build his temple, his church. And that's what we're doing today. For sure, the result of seeking first God's kingdom will not necessarily be earthly prosperity. It won't guarantee even a large, successful church. Jesus doesn't promise a plan A experience in this world. His own earthly ministry was not characterized by prosperity or a large following. You remember that? Jesus didn't build the world's biggest church when he was here. He didn't have this huge following. 120 people were left in the upper room when he died and went to heaven, when he died, resurrected, and went to heaven. His own earth, earthly ministry, somebody couldn't look at that and say, boy, Jesus, was he really prospered. His group really grew. But God does promise to be with us, his repentant people in the present, and he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, according to Ephesians 1.3. Even now, he's at work in us by his spirit, convicting us of sin, stirring up this, to, to, to strive to build his kingdom. And I hope that's what's taking place tonight, that you're getting motivated by what this prophet had to say. Yeah, it is important to build up God's house, God's kingdom. And the Lord promises to give us true and lasting satisfaction in him when we do that. What more do we need? What more could you want than to have a satisfied life now and then eternal life to follow? What more could you want? The fulfillment of his promises are not in this world, they're in the next. They're in this new Jerusalem that awaits us that we talk so much about in the last few weeks in our study of Revelation. This present life, it's often a struggle, just like it was for the returning exiles during Haggai's time. We find ourselves struggling to be faithful in the midst of overwhelming trials. But very shortly, very shortly indeed, we will find satisfaction for all eternity. In the meantime, let's seek to build God's kingdom together as we build up one another. Promoting, or, or uh, 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 what does it say? Prompting one another to good works. Loving one another. Loving this lost world out there. Presenting the gospel to them. Seeing God work in their lives. Saving them. Adding to the church. And so on and so forth. That's how we build the temple today. I know it's a temptation in our American culture. I know it's a huge temptation to build your own houses. And, I, and, and again, I'm not going to use this sermon to browbeat you and say, you know, you shouldn't have a nice car. You shouldn't go on vacation. You shouldn't do that. I'm just saying, you want a satisfying life, you seek first the kingdom of God. You build up his kingdom. And then you won't even worry about that stuff. If it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm still a happy person. I still have a wonderful life. In fact, I have an abundant life right now, even though I don't have 1968 Dodge Charger with a 440 engine in it. <laughs> I can live without that. <laughs> you know, I, I can be happy without that. I can be happy without my Learjet or even a Cessna 150. I can be happy, and so can you. Seeking God's kingdom first. And so I told you, this, this has a real message for Americans and the American Christian. Just as, just as real today as it was thousands of years ago when our prophet Haggai first said these words. And so let's pray that God will make it profitable to us. Father, help us to listen to your word, repent when necessary. Uh, help us to be satisfied with our lives as we build your kingdom, seek your kingdom, build your house instead of worrying about our own. Uh, help us at the same time not to have this false guilt about having nice things as Americans. You blessed us in many ways materially, and we, we, we humbly thank you for that. We know that all of these things are because of you and your goodness, and, and you delight in blessing your children, and we are the recipients of that. But help us to keep our priorities straight and not make that the goal. Help our goal to always be to seek first your kingdom, 
and your righteousness, knowing that all these things will be added unto us. Thank you for the abundant life you've given us. Thank you for the satisfying life that we have, even in this world, a life with purpose and meaning, a life with joy and peace that passes all understanding, joy unspeakable, full of glory. Thank you for giving us all of these things. We, we praise you for that. And we are honored to be adopted into your family and be your children and to receive these blessings. But just help us to keep our priorities straight. Help our priorities to be your priorities and not the American culture's priorities that so many people have fallen, trap, uh, fallen into that trap. Give us biblical wisdom, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.